He still speaks. He never stops speaking. He continues to speak. We just have to be willing to listen. When he speaks to us, he is always gentle and kind, sometimes a little more forceful. Sometimes God wants to get our attention. Sometimes God just wants us to open our eyes and see what's going on. But God's promise of his presence is with us forever and ever and ever. And as we continue to look at the promises of God that affect us, not just the promises we like to, to hold on to because they make us feel good, but, but cause us to, to live differently because of this promise, uh, uh, promises that affect us deeply on the inside, not just on the possibilities of what we can get out of it. But the fact God does this for us requires us to accept it in a way and live in a way that changes us on the inside out. That God loves us so much, He doesn't want us to continue in this mess that we're in most of the time. And most of us will say, my life's pretty good. And, there, and, and, and I, I love my life. I, my life's great. But we live in a world that isn't all that good sometimes. And we live in places and we live as, in human bodies that aren't always in the best of shape and have difficulties and we have we live in a, a time where we have stuff that breaks down and we we live in a time and place where where things things wither and get rusted and moth-eaten and and life is not heaven on earth for most of us now I think we might have a few folks in here that have a perfect life and nothing is wrong with their lives and they got all the money they need and they got all the everything they need and their cars are perfect and their houses are perfect and their clothes are perfect and they're perfect and they never had a sickness in their life. Anybody here like that? Well, I can keep my hand down. That's for sure. So God's promise of His presence, the promise of God's presence is probably one of the greatest promises other than eternal life which we'll look at as our last promise after revival but this promise of God's presence is the essence of why we're here in the first place one of Jesus' name that's given to us in scripture is Emmanuel in the Hebrew Amanu means with us and El is God simply means God with us that's Jesus' one of his names in Scripture is God with us. Jesus, the word Jesus, the name Jesus means Savior. And a Savior doesn't just come and go. A Savior saves. It's continuous saving is what his name means. A saving at the beginning, it's saving in the middle, a saving at the end, all the way through, he will be with us. Praise God. Any amens around here? I mean, he, doesn't, he just doesn't fix us and say, okay, now go out and do it. You're on your own. I did everything I could once. Now if you mess it up, it's your problem. He doesn't do that. He doesn't say, well, you know, I'll save you once, but you mess up again. Well, that's your problem. You know, that's, that's your issue. You know, it's like uh, fool me once, you know, shame on me, or shame on you. Shame, fool me twice, shame on me. God says, you never fool me. But I'm with you anyway. And I love you anyway. When I look at the life of Moses, I realize Moses, even though he is, is, lives such an extraordinary life, the story we're going to look at today is a story of really the Christian life that we have today in this world that we live in. You see, he's dealing with some people. He's he, he's, he's done what God's called him to do and, and he had to struggle with this call and, and he went to Egypt and he did everything God told him to do and got the Israelites out of, out of Egypt and they, they traveled and they got trapped as you know at the, sea, uh, at, the, at the Red Sea and they were scared to death they were going to die and oh Moses, Moses why would you bring us out here to die at this, in this wilderness when we could have been safe back there where we were why would you bring us out here in the middle of nowhere in this God forsaken place to kill us and God says, watch, and he opens up the seas, and they walk across. No, God will never question again. 
Oh God, and they sing this beautiful song. Oh God, thank you, thank you, God. Oh, we'll never question again. A few days later, the food runs out. Oh, God, oh Moses, Moses, why'd you bring us out here in this God-forsaken desert? We're going to starve to death out here. And we had food to eat there, even though we had to work for well, it. We had food to eat there. And God says, and gives him manna from heaven. And the water's sour, and they don't get, oh, Moses, Moses, why'd you bring out here in this, this terrible place? And we're going to, we're going to die of thirst, and, and God gives them water out of a rock. And God does something, and then they, you know, it's manna for breakfast, manna for lunch, manna for, for dinner. What in the world, oh, we're sick and tired of manna. We want some meat. At least in Egypt we had meat. And God gave them so many quail, they got sick from eating so much. And he takes them to Mount Sinai where he's going to make a covenant with them and he gives them the Ten Commandments. And Moses goes up on the mountaintop and we know what they did. Moses is gone too long. And they don't know what to do without Moses telling them what to do. It's like they didn't have a brain for themselves. Didn't have any memory to remember what God had just done just a few days before. You have any memory of, of how God had brought them out. They had no memory of, of the amazing just imagine walking through columns of water on both sides, walls of water as you walk across on dry ground. How do you forget something like that? But Moses was gone too long and they just forgot all about it. So Moses is up on the mountaintop and they decide they're going to make a, a God for themselves that's going to take them back to Egypt. So they take all their gold that, that the Egyptians had given them and took all their earrings and all their necklaces and all their gold and they, they gave it to Aaron, Moses' own brother, and, Mo, and Aaron makes a calf out of it, a golden calf. Of course, when Moses comes down and sees this, that says to Aaron, what did you do? He says, oh, I don't know. They just gave me the gold and I threw it in the fire and this came out. Yeah, that sounds, sounds like a good excuse, doesn't it? And Moses gets so upset and angry, he throws down the stones with the Ten Commandments on it, and they break into pieces. And he goes back up to God, and God says, get out of here. Get these people out of here. In fact, I would like to just destroy them and start all over with you, Moses. I'll make you the founder. I'll make you the, the father of a great nation. I, I, I'm just stunned with these people. And Moses says, don't do this thing. Don't kill these people, for you have called them, and they are your people. Don't, don't kill them. And God says, well, then take them. Take them to the Holy Land. Take them to the Promised Land. Take them where, but I'm not going with you because if I do, my rage will become so great because they are stiff-necked and, and hard-headed and they just will do the wrong thing time after time after time. And all they want is what I give them. They don't want to live with me. They want me to give them everything. And Moses says what we're going to look at this morning. Let's stand together as we read in Exodus 33, verses 12 through 23. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you. Continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Then Moses said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one, no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not 
be seen. You may be seated. So Moses is standing there on a mountaintop, and he's got God in front of him who's telling him that really, you know, I'd really just like to get rid of these people and start all over with you. So that temptation is before him, and then Moses passes that temptation, says, oh no, God, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't destroy your people. I, 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 I have brought them out because you brought them out, God, and, and they are your people. And, 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 and what would the, what will, basically he says, what will the neighbors think if you destroy your own people. And God relents. And so he tells them these words, go, take them, I will give them the land as always, but I will not go with you. <coughs> Moses is standing here thinking, this is not a good bargain. You know, I know what it's been like for the last 80 years. I know what it was like to 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 live on my own as an Egyptian and, and doing whatever I thought I could do because I lived in Pharaoh's house and, and I could do whatever I wanted and I was miserable and I was upset and I, when I found out I was a Hebrew, I got so mad that I, I, I killed an Egyptian. Lord, I, I know what that's like. And then I fled from my life and I got out to the, this wilderness and I lived out here as a shepherd for 40 years just taking care of sheep out here in the desert. And I, I, I lived as a, a plains person who, who knew there was a God, but I didn't know you personally, oh God. And I know what that was like. 80 years, I know what that know what it was like without you. And now I finally found you and you, you called me up to the, the bush and I fed you in, in the bush and I heard your voice. And, and I don't want to lose that, God. I don't want you to go without us. Please, please, please. And Moses says to the Lord, you've been telling me, lead these people. And when you told me that at the, at the bush, God, you, you, you sent Aaron with me. And you said Aaron could speak for me because he could talk better than me. And Aaron went with me. And now look what happened. Aaron made this idol. Now who's going to go with me, God? Now who's going to go with me if you send us away? Who's going who's to be the one that, you, that helps me? Who's going to be the one that strengthens me? The one that holds my arms up when I'm tired? Who's going to do that now that, that, that all, all my people have betrayed everything that you wanted of them and betrayed my trust in them? And, they, and, 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 and I'm standing here before you, God, and you're before me and all these millions of people down here behind me and they're a bunch of crying, screaming babies and I cannot go down there again without you. Without you. And Moses says simply, if you're pleased with me, if you love me, he doesn't say, if you love me, let's together go and conquer the world. He says, if you're pleased with me, teach me. Teach me. Teach me your ways. Help me to know you. Help me to continue to find favor in you and not favor because, because I, I say the right words, but favor because I live my life for you. I, I give myself to you and I live in your presence. God, teach me. God's precious reply, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses gets to the meat of it when he says, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. Moses says to God, I'm not going anywhere without you. I'm not doing anything anymore on my own strength without you. I'm not going anywhere from this place. I'm going to stand right here in front of you because I'm not going to leave this place without you. Reminds me of the story of the young man out there, the hollers, and let's just say southwest Ohio, my holler that I used to live in. But this man, was, this young man was, had this, 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 this preacher that lived up on the hillside there, and, and he just so impressed with this preacher, and this preacher was such a, a holy man and trusted God so much, and, and, and was just a, a good man of great character and, and, and integrity and, and trustworthiness. And this young man says, I want to be like Pastor so-and-so. So one day he climbed up to, went up the hill to pastor's house and knocked on the door at the house and, and said, said, preacher, I want to be like you. I want to know God like you know God. Preacher looked at him and said, really? He said, yes, I want to know God the way you know God. He said, well, follow me. 
So they walked back down the hill all the way down to the river. You had the young man get down in the water and lay down face down. And the preacher took his hands and pushed his head into the water and held it there. Just held it there. And that kid started fighting and strutting, fighting and struggling and fighting and struggling until he finally let him pop up. And he took a big gasp of air. And he said, why do you try to drown me? He says, when you want God as much as you wanted your next breath, you'll get all you're ever going to want. When you want God more than anything in this world, you will have all the God you ever want. He comes and meets us even when we don't want him all that much, but we call and ask him to help us in our mess, help us get out of this problem or whatever. And he is kind and gracious and he comes and helps us, but then we find ourselves in that mess again. We find ourselves struggling again and, 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 and depressed again and upset again. And, and so, like, nothing's ever going to change. And the, and the world just goes around and around and around and around. And, and it's kind of like the, the, the book of Judges. And the Israelites, you know, they, got, they, they did things in their own, what they wanted to do and in, in their own eyes, what was right for them. And they would do it and get in trouble. And they'd get in big trouble. And they'd cry out to God. And God would send a deliverer. And they would... Praise God, they'd be released from all the problems and they'd be happy and wonderful and everything until that deliverer died and then they would just go back and do the same thing again. Sometimes we believers will do the same thing. We get in trouble, we find forgiveness from God and we want Him to help us, but God, you know, you know we just want you to help, you, help us right now, but you know, the rest of the time, we can handle this. Well, Moses, after 80 years, was done with handling this. Moses was done with saying, I can handle this. He says, God, I'm not going anywhere. I am not going anywhere unless you are with me and in me and leading me and pushing me and teaching me and filling me with wisdom every moment of my life. I'm not leaving. I want you more than breath itself. And the Lord says, I will do the very thing you have asked. Because I am pleased with you. And I know you by name. You realize God knows each one of us by name? He knows each one of us by name. He knows us, every bit of us. He knows what's going inside of us. He knows the things that we have done in the past and the things that have been forgiven are no more. He doesn't think about those things, but the things we hold on to, all the garbage that we carry around in our hearts, all the stuff we won't let go of, all the things that we hide behind the screen that we, nobody can see, all the things, the, the, the Wizard of Oz stuff, you know, that goes on back here and we turn the wheels and make everybody think everything's great out here and that we're all and powerful, but back here we're just a little... Help! Help! He sees all of it. He sees all of it. And yet he knows us by name. And he calls us to walk with him. To be with him all the time. And he teaches. And he moves. And he is pleased with us. Pleased with us. When we want him in our lives. He is pleased with us when we say, God, I'm not going anywhere without you. I'm not going to do anything else on my own power. I want you, oh God. Now you would think after Moses got that promise, and that statement, I, I'm pleased with you, and, and I know you by name, and I will go with you. I mean, you know, I think I might stop, right, stop there. If I'm asking God for things, I mean, what else could you want? But Moses pulled up his shirt and said, well, God, I got one more thing. One more thing. Show me your glory. Let me see you. Let me see you at work. Let me see you in person. Let me see you. I, I've heard your voice in the, in the burning bush. And I've seen your shining glory. And I've seen you move in such a way that, 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 that my face shines. Nobody can even look in my face because my face shines. But I want to see you. 
And God says, I'll cause my goodness to pass in front of you, and I'll proclaim my, my name the Lord in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I have will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. God's mercy is his mercy, his compassion is his compassion, and he freely pours it out on anyone who calls on his name. But he tells him we can't see, his, see him in his face. He can't see his face. Physically see his face. Why? Because even as human beings, saved and even sanctified human beings, we are still less than the extreme holiness of God. And we'd be overwhelmed. Remember Isaiah being in the presence of God, just seeing the glory of, of the temple, fell flat on his face and says, Woe is me, I am condemned. I am doomed because I'm in the presence of an almighty, holy God, and I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm a man of, of no good in front of God. And God sends this angel and touches Isaiah's lips. It says, go, go, and I will be with you, and I'll give you the words to say, and I'll walk with you every step of the way, and I will be the strength that you need. But God doesn't say, well, you know, I, I, I'm not, I know you can't, you can't, you can't handle it. You can't handle being in my presence. You're too, you're no good. You can't handle being in my He says, No. I will show you what you can handle. I will be with you in a way that is, is amazing. But right over there, there's a rock. Right over there is a big rock. Go over there and stand on that rock. Go stand on that rock and just wait. And when I pass by, when, he didn't say, and I'll immediately come by. He says, when I pass by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and I will hide you and I'll put my hand over you and protect you from what will kill you and I will watch over you and as I pass and I'll remove my hand and you can see my presence as I pass by. The promise of God's presence. You know, we live in a world that we're not, we're not too patient, are we? I shared before how I don't like waiting a minute and 30 seconds to get my popcorn. I go to fast food, I think it should be fast, you know what I'm saying? Light turns red. That's long enough. We're not very patient people anymore. I think God is telling him in our world oh don't just stand there do something we hear all the time don't be lazy don't just sit around don't wait don't stand there don't just stand there do something God's telling Moses this day don't just do something stand there wait on me I promise you if you'll stand there on that rock and just wait you will get everything you can imagine that I can give you. And if we are determined not to run ahead of God, we're determined not to do things in our own way, we're determined not to, to try to fix the world in our own, we're determined that, that what I do here on this earth apart from God, whoever, who, you know, and, and we get into all the elections and everything else, that somehow that's going to be the answer. If we think we get ahead of God that way, then we're in trouble. But God says, trust me and wait. That doesn't always mean staying in one place and sitting on our behinds and waiting for God to do something. We've got to continue living our lives and doing the things God calls to do on a regular basis. But sometimes it takes a while to see God's answers to our prayers. It takes a while sometimes to see the, the Spirit move by in such an amazing way that He meets us in a way that we, we never dreamt possible. But it doesn't happen immediately sometimes. But the presence of God, the promise of God's presence in us and for us 
is a promise that tells us and calls us to simply say, God, I am not going anywhere without you. That I need you more than anything this world can offer. I need you more than a better job. I need you more than, 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 than a, a, a better car. I need you more than, than more money. I need you more than feeling good. I need you more than, than fame and fabulous things. I need you more than, than being liked. I need you more than reputation. I need you more than anything. And God, I want you more than anything. And I'm going to lay all those things aside. And I'm going to stay here with you. And go wherever you want me to go. And do whatever you want me to do. And I know these people are not going to change down here. I know they're going to be a, a pain in my side the rest of my life. I know that we're going to have to struggle all the way through the desert. And I'm sure that somehow, some way, they'll mess it up again, which they did with the whole spies and coming back and saying, no, we can't go in there. But he, but he says, but I can do this. I can go and I can do what you're asking me to do if you go with me. You ever been there? You ever feel like that sometimes what you got stuff to do and you, if you're trying to fix things and you're trying to make this happen, you're trying to do this, you're trying to do that, you've got 50 places to be at one time and, and next thing you know the whole day is gone, you haven't even thought about God one second. You know, you got, you got games to go to, you got kids there, you got this here, you got that there, you got this over here, you got this over here, you got a thousand things on your plate, you got a million things that are more important than what? More important than our time with God? More important than just waiting for His Spirit to move? More important than giving us a sense of His presence in every place we go? I've shared many times about Brother Lawrence, one of the great Middle Ages monks. Brother Lawrence, make his story as short as possible, Brother Lawrence was a new monk and he went to a new monastery and being a new initiate, they put him into the kitchen to wash dishes. So he washed the, washed the breakfast dishes after breakfast and it took so long to do that, the next thing he knew it was lunchtime. He washed all the lunch dishes and the next thing he knew it was supper time. He washed all the supper dishes and then it was time for evening prayers and go to bed. He says, I can't do this. I can't do this. I didn't come to the monastery. I didn't come to, 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 to learn more about God by washing dishes. I can't do this. And God got close to him and drew close to him and said, you know what? Do you realize that I'm right here with you washing dishes? And I'm right here as you stand here washing these dishes and you're doing the stuff and you break a dish and I, I'm right there with you in that midst. When, when you see all the mess that these, these other monks bring in and you're grumbling out of their mouth like, that's the messiest people I've ever seen in my life. That I'm right there with you. For the next number of years, Brother Lawrence washed dishes. He began to practice what he called practicing the presence of Christ. And everything he did, he imagined that God was right there with him in Jesus Christ. That everything, while his hands were in the water, Jesus was there with him in the water. When, when he was cleaning the floor, Jesus was there sweeping with him. When he was breaking up the dishes, when the dishes would fall and break and he had to clean those up, Jesus was there Swooping him up with him, that, that Jesus was with him every step of the way, that God promised to never leave him or forsake him, and he was going to believe it and live like it. But it's hard for us sometimes, isn't it? To live each moment fully believing that God is with us. Do we even think that he's with us? Do we even wonder if he's with us or not? We get so busy, get so caught up in stuff, get so worried about stuff. We watch the news and wring our hands about what's going on in the world and who's going to win and all this stuff. And we, we look out at, we get the bills coming in the mail and how are we going to pay this and how are we going to do this and if the car doesn't quite start, well what am I going to do now? I'm going to have to get another car and I got to do this and I got to that. I, 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 I. And God says to us, just as he did to Moses, 
Trust me. Wait for me. Wait for me in this situation. And I'll be everything you need me to be. Trust me in this situation. I will be with you every step of the way. But God, you don't understand this, this, this report I got from the doctor that I'm going to die. And Jesus says, hey, I know what that's like. And I'll be with you every step of the way. And it's not the end of the world. Because I am with you. And you will always be with me. Why? Because you trust me. And you love me. And I love you. The promise of God's presence is a promise that, that we can celebrate, that we can enjoy, that we can say, praise God, no matter what I do, I know I can, can run into God and pull out my, my faith out of my pocket and say, okay, God, here it is, save me. Or we can understand that this faith that God calls this promise is a daily, moment by moment, living in the power of the Holy Spirit, living in His presence, dying to ourselves, Say, so God, it's not about what I want. It's not about what I feel. It's not about what I want you to do. You know, I know I've said this a lot, but, you know, how many times have we prayed, God, here's the problem, and here's how you need to fix it. I know what's best, God. You just need to do what I think. No. We need to take ourselves. Paul tells us we should live our lives as living sacrifices. Sacrifice in the Old Testament, you brought your best of the best. You brought your best lamb, you best your, brought your first crops, you brought your very best stuff, and you brought it to the altar and gave it to God. And when we come to the altar and we come and pray to God, what do we bring to Him? Our junk, all of our problems, all of our issues. God, get us out of this mess, get us out of this mess, help us with this mess. God helped so-and-so in that mess. We bring him all of our garbage. And Paul tells us, okay, bring your garbage, but bring yourself too. And lay yourself on the altar with your junk and all. And I will take you just the way you are. I will take you just the way you are with all of your warts and all of your pain and all, all your sorrow and all your past and all that stuff. I will take you just the way you are and I will be with you. And we will deal with these things. And you will find forgiveness and you'll find healing. You'll find hope. And I will be with you all the days of your life. And then for all of eternity, I will be with you. Isn't that a blessing? Isn't that a great promise? promise of God's presence that calls us more than just saying praise God he's with me but living a life that believes it and lives like it and trusts him in the midst of the storm as you go to prayer this morning I, I ask, ask it we consider if we're holding on to things, if we're trying to hold on to parts of our own lives, we're trying to still be in control of the things that we feel is most important to us, and, you know, we, we are afraid what God might do with it. I've been there. God, you know I really like this right here in my life. You know I enjoy doing this right here. And I'm afraid, God, if I give it to you, you're going to tell me I have to stop doing it. So, God, I'm just going to hold on to this without really talking to you about it. Or we want to we want to hold on to parts or, of things of the past that, that are long gone. But we don't want to give them to God. We want to hold on to them. Because either we love them or we hate them. Sometimes we hold on to our bitterest memories because somehow we find comfort from being still being angry from what happened 30 years ago. And God says, give me all of it. Give me you with all of this stuff. And I will be with you all the days of your life and I will heal you from your pain and I will give you hope in the future that's a wonderful promise let's go to prayer today I, I pray the Lord will help us to love him with all of our hearts 
mind, soul, and strength to love our neighbors as ourselves. It's a very simple thing, isn't it? We make life so complicated sometimes. We try to put things in so many categories that we have to keep track of. God says, love me and love everybody. Stay with me and I will stay with you. I will be with you through all of it.